I'm going to kick off with you, Dennis, and a question that will occur to everyone who has read your contemporary crime novels. Why history, and what made you go back to 1918? Um, can I, oh, sorry. Well, the short answer is because that's when the Boston police strike happened. So, um, <laughs> I don't want to be glib, but, but it is, that it's just, you know. Um, but I did notice that um, for, uh, for Shutter Island and then for this, I was writing in the past. So that's seven years of writing books set in the past. And I think it was there was something about the last ten years um, that I just uh, I couldn't find a way to write about them directly. And and I'm a um, much better writer when I write obliquely. And so part of me just without plan, any sort of plan just found myself gravitating to the past to write about the present. If you, if you will, I don't think books are books are not necessarily about the time in which they're set. They're they're I know it's a little postmodern, but they're usually about the time in which they're written. So okay. well, that's a really interesting answer because actually one of the questions I'm going to ask uh, in a in a hopefully in a, um, some minutes time is about the way the past impacts on the present. Mm -hmm. But um, but what I wanted to do ask you about too was um, my favorite part of the book, apart from the police the, the police um, the police strike, and actually there's so much that happens in 1918 Boston. Um, there's just so much to write about, um, and Dennis does it so fantastically well. Um, but my favorite book, uh, my favorite part of the book, um, was the flu epidemic. It was a bit like a sort of medieval plague. Um, I wondered whether you could tell us all a little bit how it arrived and a little bit more, more of that sort of thing. Well, the reason the flu got in there was, um, and the reason the book started with baseball and the reason, uh, <laughs> I mean, a lot of the sort of unraveling started because the Spanish flu is called the Spanish flu because they, they thought that the first people to carry it were Spanish sailors. They weren't. What happened in the Spanish flu was this. They believe now that what happened was it started in a place called Fort Riley, Kansas, it killed all the soldiers there that it could kill, and then it incubated. They carried it over to France. They spread it gradually in France in this weird kind of incubation stage. They came back to America. The Chicago Cubs were playing the Boston Red Sox in the fifth game of the World Series. But baseball was exceptionally unpopular at that point because of war propaganda. Um, it, was, it was called, um, uh, basically, if you didn't fight for the war, you were considered a slacker. So right. nobody wanted to see a bunch of guys play, play a game. Right. So it was the lowest attended World Series in history. The Red Sox and the Cubs discovered that they were being um, shafted on what they were supposed to be paid, so they refused to come out and play the game. The fans in the stands went crazy because in the stands were soldiers who'd just come back from the war, and so the fans rioted. Those soldiers were carrying the Spanish flu. They were probably the typhoid Mary of the Spanish flu. They, that nobody could ever figure out for years, it got lost to history, why did the Spanish flu first break up in Boston and Chicago, but okay, not New York right. or Philadelphia? And it was because it started at the World Series. And the Chicago people carried it back on their trains, and the Boston right. people had it. And, uh, and so that was, I said, I'm going to tell that story. And then I started, so I had Babe Ruth on a train, and then it ended up becoming another story. And then I said, well, i got to get that information in, and then realized the only way to get that information in would be to step from behind the curtain and say, well, nobody knew this then, but actually, <laughs> history is... So I couldn't do it. So the reason for starting the book, the where I started the book, okay. was to get to that story, and I never got to that story. And from that point on, from that day, which was September 10th, um, that was the, when the Spanish flu started for all intents and purposes. And by the time it was finished, it finished in China. It killed 60 million people. Yeah, uh, it, it know? killed more people than the, the, the First World War did. Oh, right. It, it yeah. wasn't even close, yeah. you know. Yeah. And um, and so, yeah, that was that was a crazy, crazy, crazy time. Oh, right, you know? so. right. Okay. So I'm going to turn to you, Tess, next, and just say, hmm, disease, history, um, both key preoccupations. It's right up my you. alley. <laughs> In fact, um, Tess's previous book, The Bone Garden did exactly that and you so you two step back in time um how, how, was that a difficult thing to do um no because i think i was so uh, inspired by the subject matter i um, i came to it because i had been asked to give a speech on the anniversary of mary shelley's death and i was doing some research into mary shelley and discovered that her mother died of a disease called childbed fever now i as a doctor had heard about childbed fever but had never seen a case of it myself and reading into the history of it 
you know, the horror just kind of kept creeping up on me. Um, let me kind of describe what it would have been like back then in, in, in the eight, early 1800s. You would have come into a lying-in hospital ready to have your child, and uh, there would have been women dying all left to the left and to the right of you. The descriptions of it were so horrible that I mean, we can't even imagine nowadays. The smells of, that, of the ward were so, so, so bad that I understand husbands would not come in to visit their dying wives because it stank so badly. The, uh, the conditions of hospitals were such that they were sometimes putting women t uh, two to a bed. Um, they would sometimes not bother to clean the sheets between dying patients. So you would check in to, uh, to give birth and you would crawl into bed on sheets that were crusted with blood. Um, during epidemics of childbed fever, uh, up to one out of five women would die, and they could not build the coffins fast enough. So the descriptions of, of the, the coffin maker in the courtyard constantly hammering throughout the day must have not been very pleasant for these poor women who had come in to have their babies. Um, and in some hospitals, uh, it was described, I know, in, in Budapest, that if you would look in one direction, you could see the cemetery, and if you looked in the other direction, you could see the door leading to the autopsy room. So reading about the description of it, and it's a very, very painful way to die. Uh, within a couple of hours after giving birth, you would swell up and have a fever and shaking chills. And it was so painful that just to turn a woman in bed would cause her to scream uh, in, in agony. And within a couple of days, uh, they would almost invariably die. So, you know, because I write books that I always try for that sense of horror in myself. I'm always paying attention to my own uh, internal reactions to things that I learn, I knew that I wanted to write about this, this, this epidemic. I wanted to write about not just childbed fever, but about medicine, about where were the beginnings of understanding of the microbial world? When did doctors understand that they needed to wash their hands? Because the real horror about the childbed fever epidemic was that it was spread by doctors. Um, Doctors and medical students would be doing autopsies on women who had died of it. They would, they would have their arms elbow deep in muck. They didn't have gloves back then. They'd be called to go to the lying-in ward to deliver a child, and they would come out without washing their hands. Uh, and that was really what was happening, is that they were, they were killing women. They were going down the ward killing women with their filthy hands. Um, and the one interesting thing for me as a doctor was, you know, who was responsible for changing that? And in the United States, it was one particular man called Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes. I wanted to see what kind of a man he was. What was he like in medical school? Um, what kind of an education did he have? What made him different from other doctors who were blithely going around killing women? Um, and that was where the bone garden came in. I just wanted to do a thriller set in the year when Oliver Wendell Holmes was 1830. I wanted to see how medical, how, how doctors thought, and I wanted to see what the conditions were of medical education were back then. I didn't even need to put in a serial killer in that story because I think the reality was, was pretty scary enough.